morning. Welcome to this uh, session where we're going to discuss the future of energy and the region and what it means for not only the United States but uh, the Middle East and uh, other players, global players. Um, I'm very delighted to have three experts sitting here with me on this panel and um, the way we're going to do this is I do a brief introduction and uh, each, of the j each of you will have uh, five to seven minutes to give uh, a small presentation and set the floor and then uh, we will do a Q&A and I would, engage, I would love to engage you all in the Q&A so please don't be shy and raise your hands whenever you have a question. Um, to my left is uh, Robert Kaplan. He's the chief geo geopolitical analyst for Stratfor and a book author. He has authored 14 books and has the next one coming out soon. Thanks for being here. Then uh, Robbie Diamond. Yes, Diamond is his real name. It's not uh, fake. So <laughs> he's the founder and president and CEO of Securing America's Future Energy, also from the United States. Welcome. And Mehmet Uju. The chairman, global resource, uh, for the, the chairman of Global Resource Partnership from the UK and Turkey, um, Hoş Geldiniz. And uh, Mr. Kaplan, why don't you start with your presentation first? All right. Well, thank you very much. It's a great honor and privilege to be here in this lovely aesthetic country of Morocco, where the aesthetics, the art, the landscape are just, just magnificent, where the Atlantic comes together with the Mediterranean. Uh, the energy, let me start here, the energy climate is changing dramatically, but it's not so simplistic as people think. The United States is not deserting the Middle East because of shale oil, um, uh, shale gas. Let me explain and unpack this. The U.S. does have vast deposits of shale gas in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, western New York State, Ohio, North Dakota. It's, it's a bonanza of new energy. Uh, the U uh, this will be uh, th this new energy will be excavated by a technique called fracking, which requires water, a significant amount of water. Uh, my, one of my fellow panelists will explain more about that. But the key thing here is not only does the U.S. have shale but it has the local water resources, the knowledge of geography, the distribution networks in order to, in order to maximize its value. The U.S. Has more, you know, has more miles of navigable inland waterways than any other co temperate zone continental space in the world. And that, really, uh, uh, you know, and that really magnifies the importance of what shale can do for the U.S. Um, it's going to be a real boon, a bonanza for U.S. manufacturing and aluminum, chemical, plastics, and other things who will make use of this energy. Um, the, the United States geographically, geologically is truly a blessed country. Um, and this will become even more apparent in the years and decades ahead. Nevertheless, um, the U.S. still needs crude oil for its transport system, for its interstate highways, for its automotive system, and particularly it needs medium and heavy, and heavy crude, and significant amounts of that will continue to come from the Middle East. In addition, keep in mind, it's like a stock portfolio for your own financial um, well-being. You diversify your portfolio and a country diversifies its energy portfolio, meaning the the United States is going to be importing significant amounts of crude from the Persian Gulf, from the greater Middle East for many years to come. Um, so the U.S. is not simplistically deserting the Middle East. First of all, the U.S. cares about the Persian Gulf, not just because of oil for the U.S., but in order to protect the energy sources of its allies in the region and around the world. The United States navies chief function in a way is to protect what's called the slots, the sea lines of communication, to enable energy to go from the Gulf and other places to the various countries around the world. The global system upon which energy pathways depend is protected by the U.S. Navy and Air Force, and that will continue to be a major interest for the United States, and that's why the, the Persian Gulf will stay important for the United States. Now, the 
effect of U.S. energy discoveries is going to have an effect on Russia and Eastern Europe, you should keep in mind. Um, for the moment, Russia is the kingpin of supplying natural gas and oil to a lesser extent to Europe. While Europe gets between a fourth and a third of its energy from Russia, it, what's more important is that the further you move Eastern Europe, from Western Europe to Central Europe, from Central Europe to Eastern Europe, the more dependent a country is on Russia. So that Latvia, Poland, Bulgaria, and other countries of Eastern Europe depend as, as much as 90% on Russian natural gas. But that may change in the years and decades to come. Um, because the U.S. and other en energy suppliers will, could be cutting into the Russian monopoly. And countries like Poland and Lithuania will be, will be building regasification facilities um, to take advantage of, oil, of natural gas imported from elsewhere. Um, and, with this, and, and this, of course, could be a real impediment to Russian power. Vladimir Putin is very strong now. He will be in five years. But in 10 or 15 years, the situation could get more subtle. Um, it's possible that the U.S. could build liquefaction facilities, to, that is to take natural shale gas and convert it into liquid for transport across the country, uh, across the oceans to a country like Poland, um, it, which would then regasify it. Um, these facilities would be built on the Gulf Coast, you know, by Texas, Louisiana, where all of this shale is located. This could be par part of a big bonanza for the Caribbean region. The Caribbean region is, uh, is it, you know, with the widening of the Panama Canal is going to be increasingly important. And your final point? And my final point is that the U.S. will be able to project power increasingly because of energy throughout the world, but because of the democratization process throughout the Middle East with quasi and semi-chaos around, the U.S. is going to find it harder to exert its influence in individual countries. So it's a, it'll be a two-edged street in terms, of, in terms of U.S. power. Thanks, Mr. Kaplan, for setting the floor. And uh, Mr. Diamond, when you hear all this, Mr. Kaplan is talking about the fact that the U.S. will still be independent, uh, still be depending on the Middle East. And, your organization, it seems, is actually lobbying for more energy um, independence, and you have a lot of former military people in there, and it sounded as if um, your aim is actually to reach the point where the U.S. could just pack and say ma salama to the region and, uh, and be uh, independent, or is this a false uh, impression? So th thank you very much. Um, thank you all for your uh, hospitality here and for inviting me. I would say that uh, you know we actually are not looking for independence. I think what we're looking for is what we call energy security and a flexibility to be able to um, choose the foreign policy, military policy that we, we'd rather have than the one we're forced into. And for that, let me go back and talk briefly about uh, oil markets, the short term and the long term, and how although things seem to be radically changing at the moment, really they're fundamentally the same. And in fact, some of the beliefs we have in the short term could actually harm us over the long term. So in oil markets, oil is a global commodity. And I think that's what most people forget. And there's one global oil market. You've got OPEC countries that uh, manage the market on one side. And then you've got non-OPEC OECD countries that uh, drill for oil as well. And those come together as, in some ways, I would say it's like a bathtub. Everyone pours their oil into the tub, and then everyone takes it out, and a global price is determined uh, based by traders based on how they see how much oil there is, how much they need, where the instability is, how much risk there is. And so in truth, it doesn't really matter um, where the oil comes from. It matters uh, how, much, how risky people believe that oil is coming from that place and how much there's oil in other places in the world to make up for it. And so the real, the real mark of dependence for the entire globe, actually, is that the transportation sector, which requires oil, um, really there's no alternative in transportation. There's no uh, alternative that is scalable. In the United States, for example, um, when they had the OPEC oil embargo, um, which was 40 years ago on October 17th, uh, the United States transportation sector required 95% of its, of, its, of its fuel was oil, and there was no substitutes. 
Now, 40 years later, it's 93% and projected to be 91% um, going forward. And so really it's this idea of having a monopoly of one fuel on the transportation sector, which requires no choice. So if something happens in the world, whether it be uh, Libya um, going offline or uh, instability in Iraq or other places, uh, the price goes up and everyone pays for that. Um, and every major global recession has been preceded by an oil price spike. And so this is fundamentally the question of uh, dependence. The question of dependence, the only way to then solve it is to find ways to create choice in the transportation sector. So that as prices go up or something happens in the world, one is able to choose another fuel to put into their vehicle. Now we see that happening in some cases, natural gas um, uh, or electric vehicles we could, we could talk about. But of course it's happening at a very slow pace compared to the amount of oil we use. Globally, we use now 90 million barrels and the International Energy Agency just released their, their, their study, their global outlook, where we'll be up to 103 million barrels of oil required by 2035. Mr. Diamond, can I just ask you quickly because yeah. um, Mr. Kaplan mentioned also fracking and since we're talking about alternatives, who of you knows what fracking is because that's Okay, then maybe would you mind explaining a couple of sentences? I will, I will, I will get there right now, actually. Thank so it's a good, good, good point. So um, the reason I said how much oil we use in the market is because it's really important to put that fracking into context. So the United States, uh, just five years ago, saw declining oil output and increasing imports. And now you actually have the reverse. Our, uh, our, our production is going up dramatically. Actually, the most we produced more last month than we have since 1995. And it's just going up and up and up, and our imports are going down and down and down. And so it's an exact reversal of what experts uh, thought before. And why did this happen? And it's something called hydraulic fracturing and what is called directional drilling. And so it used to be that you'd go out and you'd find an oil deposit or a natural gas deposit. You'd go look for it. You'd explore for it. You'd find a big deposit. You'd essentially stick a straw into the ground and you'd, you'd, you'd bring it up. But now what they discovered is that oil and natural gas are actually, you can actually get them out of what is highly, highly uh, tight rock. It doesn't have to be a big sort of pool. And you have this tight rock. And what they do is they drill down, then they drill across up to eight miles. And then they pump liquid, which is called hydraulic fracturing, which is pumping both liquid and sand and some chemicals, which is a propent to open up the rock once they sort of blow it up underground and all the oil and gas start rushing out. And so the United States that was producing almost none of this um, you know, four, four years ago is producing now 2.5 mil million barrels a day of uh, this liquid tight oil. Um, it's actually producing 29 BCF or 40% of its natural gas is coming from this type of production. And it's really, what I'd say is it's very different than we'd have production before as I said, it's really about a manufacturing process going from well to well. Just as an example, last year in uh, North America, they drilled 6,500 wells. Now, in the rest of the world, they drilled 100. So it's a totally different thing. But, the, but at the end of the from, day... From what I understood, the fracking, there are still, it's still not clear what long-term uh, uh, effects this might have for the environment. So there are, there's a lot of uh, discussion about uh, that as well. There, there is. In some countries they've stopped it. In the United States there's been some states that haven't wanted it. But for the most part it is a moving freight train in the United States. But by 2020 the international agency projects that it will start to decline. And so that's my point. So basically we're talking about 2.5 million barrels of oil. Right. It's supposed to go to 4 million barrels of oil. We have a market that's 90 million barrels. So it's very small. Maybe from a United States context it's very large. But if we have a global market and there's a global price, it really doesn't matter that we produce our own oil. Because it's what Robert said, it matters that we care about the price of oil and the global price of oil. So anything that happens anywhere, the United States and its military and its foreign policy will make a bit This we'll will be our it. second round, which um, will talk about why, what, what, what effects might this have on the price of oil and so on. But Mehmed, um, when you hear all this, and you're somebody who also advises politicians and countries, um, and we take it back to the region, what effects will all this have in countries such as Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait? Um, Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that in your six minutes presentation. 
Thank you. I'll try to do that. But before that, I think it's important to uh, address a couple of issues raised here. Then I would like to put this in the broader global context, because U.S. shale gas independence uh, is just one of the game changers that we are observing. And ahead of us, uh, especially with regard to the region, there are other key uh, variables that we have to look into. I think with regard to U.S. Uh, unconventional revolution, uh, one factor to consider is that it is not becoming global. So now it's limited to North America, U.S. and Canada. It is difficult to replicate what's happening in that continent in other parts of the world. If you look at the reserves map of unconventionals, China has more reserves of shale gas than U.S. has. But it cannot mobilize it for the reason Robert mentioned, water issue and also property ownership issue is quite uh, key there. So it's not replicated in China, Europe, and uh, Ukraine, Algeria, and in this region. Uh, that's one point that we have to bear in mind. So it's a bit localized in the US and Canada right now. Therefore, the global implications will depend on whether the US Congress will allow shale gas to be exported as LNG at the prices where it is today, about $3.5, I think, and BTU, compare this with European prices, almost 9, 10, and Japan, what we call Japanese cocktail price, is around uh, 17, 18 dollars. So there's a huge difference. And if this exporting will happen, of course it's not going to happen in the same price, it, but still it will be cheaper than where it's consumed in other parts of the world. It will affect significantly the balances and, as well as the um, competitiveness of the US versus other nations. And I also have serious thoughts that U.S. will continue to sustain. I want to challenge what you said um, uh, with due respect. The U.S. may not be able to sustain its engagement in the Middle East and the Gulf. Of course, the rhetoric will have it that, yes, of course, we'll continue our presence there. It's not only oil and gas that keeps us in the Gulf and Middle East. Because if you look at the picture, U.S. also has a very strong presence in the Gulf for other areas. Let's take... Uh, aerospace and defense exports to the region to the tune of almost $100 billion. There you need allies and uh, good customers. And uh, also, I don't know how you will be able to convince the U.S. public and Congress to continue patrolling the Strait of Hermes and Malacca Strait, through which uh, today almost 80% of China's oil and gas imports go. So uh, Chinese are sort of a free rider in this region, enjoying the U.S. security umbrella. It may not be sustainable at a time when U.S. is having serious difficulties, cutting back the budget of Pentagon. So how would you able to run all these aircraft carriers and air forces in the region where your interest is not so strong in terms of energy security, but there are other interests? And I want to say perhaps a couple of words about the global game changers beyond uh, the U.S. that we discuss. One thing is that the world's uh, consumption map has changed significantly. It's no longer the OECD countries soaking up all the energy produced by traditional players. Now you have China consuming much more, and India consuming much more than the OECD countries. And almost 80% of the incremental demand growth between now and 2035 will come from this region. And you have to feed this region. Only in China, I was told that uh, in Beijing, a couple of months ago, every day, 1,900 new cars are joining the traffic in Beijing only. Imagine the rest of China, India, and other countries. So huge demand. And uh, currently, only 53% of China's uh, oil demand comes from the region as an import. And it will go up to 85% by 2035. That means 13 million barrels per day, much more than the Saudi production. So how this is going to affect, of course, this region, and uh, King Abdullah's first visit when he came to power in Saudi Arabia was to Beijing, followed by uh, Delhi and Washington. And there are shifting alliances in the region as a result of this dependence on oil from the region, as a result of shifting trade flows towards more Asia Pacific, and geopolitical realignment will come. I'm sure we'll have more opportunity to discuss this later, but let me stop here, if you like. So I'll be happy to continue. You, 
Thank you so much. I think this was a very important first round to set the floor, but I will, uh, and I will pick up some of what you just said um, about how the importance of the region and Robbie and Robert, as Mehmet said, how will the US in future justify uh, certain wars, certain interventions, uh, given that in the past the people or the public in the US would always kind of understand, um, okay, we have to go to Iraq because yes, there is oil, um, Libya, yes, they have also oil and gas and so on. But um, if now certain politicians in Washington believe that there will be um, energy independence, because that's, this is what one can hear if you're going to certain areas there, um, how will this, how will you justify? Um, yes, uh, first of all, the United, the, the American public is not against U.S. power. What it's against is the projection of U.S. ground forces in messy wars in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. But the American public has always fully supported a big air force and a big navy. And remember, American power is about air and sea power, where it, which it projects across a global landscape. The United States Navy is currently 284 warships. Even with budget cuts and lowering of uh, public support, that could go down to 270, 260 warships. That's still more than the rest of the world's navies combined. So that the, U uh, the United States Navy and Air Force, even with somewhat reduced public support and, and somewhat reduced budgets, is still going to be the biggest kid on the block. Remember, the pu the pub what the public doesn't want is, 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 is is messy ground involvement that it doesn't understand and that it feels is a waste. But the idea of U.S. ships and planes patrolling the high seas for the sake of the global system is something the American public continues to support. And remember, despite isolationist tendencies here and there in Congress elsewhere, election, general elections for president are, tend to be won by middle-of-the-road internationalists. No. But as a matter of fact, the invasion of Iraq messed the country even more up than it was before. I mean, if we, we look at the situation right now in Iraq, uh, you have everyday uh, suicide bombings and, and kind of, you know, these, uh, there is a, there's a civil war in, in the country. So my question also to Robbie is, um, if as a matter of fact now the, the regime in Iraq and, and what we're seeing in, in Libya is not really U.S. friendly, if we take it that way, um, how do you justify in future interactions in the region? And um, let me also get back to what you said about the Navy, but also let's talk about the Fifth Fleet in Bahrain, for example. Will the Fifth Fleet stay or leave? Right. So, you know, the first thing I, I wanted to point out is that this year, as I said, the United States is an all-time low of importing its oil. Um, it's about, uh, it's only importing about 40% of its oil, where it was at 62% in uh, only um, five years ago, and yet the United States citizens paid more for their oil and gas this year than they had in any year in history, over $900 billion. So as I say, it's a global system. And because it's a global system, the United States is going to be, be um, you know, be engaged. The real question is, is, can this provide more flexibility? You know, no one wants to go to war, and so does this, does this uh, provide more flexibility to, to the U.S. and their foreign policy to make different decisions. But as long as the transportation sector is dependent on oil for basically 100% of its needs, then the United States and every country in the world is going to care what happens here. And the real problem is, is that you've got instability in so many low-cost oil-producing places, right? So OPEC remains the low-cost oil-producing places. They're producing, I mean, I read yesterday that Iraq is about $4 a barrel. I mean, this is in a market where we're at 90-something dollars. Um, you know, but OPEC is sitting on, what, 10 to $20 production, uh, about 1.4 trillion barrels of oil. But it's a lot, very in unstable. You've got instability in Iran. You've got instability in Iraq. You've got instability in Libya. You've got, you know, questions what's going to, you know, in Saudi Arabia, stability now, but, you know, wild, when you look at wild card issues that could happen. And so the real question is, is how in a marketplace where we're totally dependent on oil, and you've got such an unstable region, which provides so much of it, what happens over time? And I think that that's why the United States will ultimately remain engaged. Now, hopefully what it does is it provides more flexibility so that the United States doesn't have to be sitting on a hair trigger trying to do their things. And the last point I want to make is, 
Look, the United States is not here, here for many, many reasons. I don't defend the U.S. government. That's not why I'm here. I don't work for them. But I would say that, you know, they're basically doing this because the, they're the global policemen for oil supply lanes. And global? the global policemen, right? So, yes, uh, they're doing it for every country in the world. The reason they're here is uh, the reason many of these wars happen is because it's all related to oil. Um, you know, why were U.S. forces in Saudi Arabia and all these things? And, you know, that, that is the consummate cause. But it's because others don't have the ability at the moment to do it. And then the United States will have to decide, do they want others to do it? Maybe it can be like the piracy issue in Somalia or off East Africa where China and others can come in and play some type of role. But right now, that does not exist. So the fifth fleet is not going to leave, you're telling us? Um, I wouldn't put my money on it. Uh -huh. uh, that it leaves or not leaves? Hmm? That it will leave or not? That I would not leave. That it's not going to leave. But I do believe that there's going to be, because of the American public, there's going to be a more of a role or a call for other countries that are now importing more of the oil from the Middle East to play a larger role in, this, in being involved in the geopolitics of the region. Now, does it mean, and also now to the, back to the panel, Mehmet, when you hear all this, um, does it mean our, the U.S. actually believes that Iraq and Iran will be better partners than other Middle Eastern countries in future, also given all the unrest that, are happening, that happened in the last two, three years in the region? Well, I think U.S. has a very difficult job to manage complex relationship between oil producers, consumers, transit countries, investors, so it's just going to be a very tough period. And uh, if you look at the, uh, also on the supply side, it's not only the United States, but we have on the horizon, on the radar, we have very significant other producers coming on stream. And uh, one of the losers will be Russia, which I will, dep I will also elaborate a little bit on Russia, because uh, right now uh, Russia is losing its market share in Europe, the only high value market it depended for so long. And the Russian exports to Asia Pacific, where the demand growth is strong, is minuscule because they don't have an infrastructure in place for that. And domestically also, Gazprom is losing ground to uh, Rosneft and other independents. And uh, so Russia is having serious difficulty. They cannot also invest heavily on the, um, the old fields in Siberia. And then Iran is emerging as a new game changer. If this uh, efforts to normalize relations with the U.S. in particular and international community at large happens, which I believe will happen sooner or later. It depends the pace of it, how it will go. And as we know, they have the second largest reserves in the world in natural gas and also one of the major producers of oil. Their production will increase uh, very, very fast. And Iraq currently producing about 2.5 uh, million barrels per day if they go up to where they want to be, aspire to be, around 8.5 million barrels per day, ambitious goal, but if there is stability and if there is sufficient investment, this is feasible because they are the second largest reserves of uh, oil in the world. Then this is going to affect the Gulf region, the OPEC countries, US, global markets significantly. Even OPEC might shatter as a result because currently, as you know, the OPEC is producing about a third of the world oil 30 million barrels per day out of 88 million barrels. And uh, then you have Australians coming on stream with huge production of LNG, uh, Mozambique, Angola, Arctic region we haven't touched even. They say a third of the world's oil and gas reserves are under Arctic as a result of the climate change, melting ice. So this is going to produce what we, I believe will be abundance of oil and gas from an era where we were so much worried about the supply deficit. And then how it's going to affect this region? I think this is a very critical question. The region is seriously concerned about the supply. He doesn't want me to speak, you see? <laughs> okay. Tough, you see? And yes, the supply abundance that is coming onto the market will be seriously affecting the current producers. And if, unless the Gulf region and other Middle Eastern uh, producers understand this global dynamic, uh, it will be very difficult for them to adapt the new picture emerging. As a result, some of them understand, as a result, you have nuclear power, renewables, and other unconventionals coming on stream in Gulf countries. But I think the leadership and the policy making in the Gulf and MENA should seriously consider 
the new configuration of the world supply, demand, picture, and the pricing. Thank you very much. Uh, Robbie wanted to answer, and then uh, Robert? Very sure. Yeah, very quickly. I, I think that the real challenge now is that people are misreading the current situation, which leads to underinvestment in OPEC countries, such as Saudi Arabia in particular. So right now, what they look at and they say, okay, the United States is producing all this oil, and they are actually right now, um, how do you say this? You know, they were caught by surprise um, at that moment. They, no one expected the oil to come on so quickly. And at the same time, the United States and other OECD countries are dropping their oil consumption. Um, it's really plateaued, and it's exactly what you said. It's all going to be um, in Asia. But, you know, investments in oil take 10 years to matter. And so the question is, is what are the investment strategies today? Because by 2020, all these dynamics we're talking about now either won't matter or they'll have exhausted themselves. The supply, as I say, or the demand is going to go up to 101 million barrels. And have the investments been made today in order to supply the oil in uh, 10 years' time? And I think that's the real question. Is there, is there like a, a supernova, you know, where it's so bright of what people are talking about in the oil markets that they don't, don't see the, uh, the, the projection forward? So, uh, Robert, quickly, and then I would yeah. encourage uh, you to I just ask want to make question. one point that we should be factoring into what Mehmet said to what Robbie said, and that's China. Um, China and India are going to have the largest expansion of the global middle class, and middle class people consume a lot of energy, much more energy than poor people. Yet China is starting to go through a tumultuous economic transition. Uh, it's 30 years of double-digit economic growth is coming to an end, has come to an end. Um, <clears throat> China is facing the problem that all countries face once they get to a higher income level. And, so, and that means there could be political and social unrest in China, which in turn could affect stability, which in turn turn could affect consumption levels. So that China, you know, you know the, the real issue, I mean, people say to me, the, the, will Iran get or not get nuclear weapons? That's the biggest issue in the world. I say no. The biggest ish, single issue in the world, to the extent that there is one, is what is the direction of the Chinese economy and society? Uh, are there maybe any questions if somebody, uh, okay. Um, why don't we start with the gentleman here? And please introduce yourself and it would be nice if you could also raise the question quickly. Uh, the gentleman here up front. The, whoever. Hello. Uh, hello, uh, I wanted to, to ask I'm, I'm working here at the Amadeus Institute, and I wanted to, to ask, does the, the, the rise of renewable energy mean peace on Earth? As we saw that um, there was a lot of war, uh, the Second War of Iraq, the, the, the First War and Second War of Iraq, uh, due to, to the, the wish for countries to control uh, oil and gas. So does, does the rise of renewable energy mean peace on Earth? And this is to the whole panel or anybody yeah. specific? Yeah. Um, maybe we take another question, a gentleman here, and then we'll get back to the panel. Hello, uh, North Africa Strategic Institute. So uh, to Mr. Kaplan and then to my friend Diamond, uh, uh, what's the theory of ground zero in all this? So let's start in by the financing. You said that this new uh, source of energy has the first, uh, the first challenge is financing. Can the uh, hard boots of the Defense Department can shift some of their, of their finance that they are like allowing now to make a lot of weaponry to the researchers on making more, as, as my friend says, to make more this, uh, this department more civil for civil and talk about uh, energy assurance instead of energy security. And... Uh, the second, the second part, when we shift, when we shift this, this challenge in the Middle East, uh, we see that the, the, the peace process talk between the Arabs and the Jews there by the U.S. retrieving from the Middle East and um, by uh, the Saudi Arabian retrieving from the, 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 the Security Council 
is this another implementing of uh, the ground zero theory, like everybody is going to play now the game by, by himself. And uh, I think I will keep the, the third question when I when face to face. Thank you. Um, so the first question was about uh, peace, on er uh, peace on Earth, if uh, these uh, alternative new energy renewables would maybe create um, peace on Earth. Um, to all of you who would like to answer I'll first. Yes, please. So I'll answer the first one. I'll leave the other one to Robert. So um, look, so you have to understand in energy, and this is like where I think a lot of people make their mistake. There's a distinction between oil and electricity. And certainly that's the case in the United States, and it's pretty much around the world. Most people do not use oil to produce electricity, except in the Middle East, which means that we, the, the majority of oil, over 60%, is used in uh, cars. In the United States, it's 73%. It's about transportation. So until you, have until you have electric cars or you have natural gas cars in wide quantity, it really you're not affecting the oil situation and the politics of oil. So that's why it's really about transportation. And so they used to say in the American context, they had politicians who would say, we need to build nuclear power plants, Republicans, so that we could uh, end our dependence on oil. And you'd have Democrats who could say, we need to build solar panels and windmills so we can end our dependence on oil. But the truth is, neither ends your dependence on oil because it's really about transportation. And so until we have an alternative to oil um, so that's not the only fuel in the transportation sector, it will have no impact on the geopolitics uh, of oil. What was the second question? Um, Mehmet, maybe you want to say something about peace on Earth, and then we'll get to... Yes, on the renewables, I could say a couple of words. Uh, unfortunately, if the, there is abundance of fossil fuels, and unfortunately, if there is so much pressure on cutting back subsidies in this budget stringent era, the prospects for renewables uh, are not so good, not, are not so bright. And because, look at Germany, it's the best example. It was one of the pioneering nations in Europe, looking, uh, uh, put, pushing very hard for greener, smarter, cleaner energy. As a result of the pricing mechanisms, now they are uh, importing heavily from US, Pennsylvania coal. They are turning all their power plants, most of their power plants, into coal and the share of renewables is decreasing. I think this is going to happen elsewhere as well. Although we all know that renewables, greener energy is our future for sustainable development, but the reality points us to still fossil fuel dominated future. And uh, the pricing as well as the uh, unconventionals and new fuels, new suppliers, will make life a bit more difficult than before for the renewable sector. Its share in the global uh, energy mix is still very small. Even if you double it over the next 20 years, still our future is with oil, gas, and coal, unfortunately. So it doesn't look good for peace on Earth so far. Um, Robert, there were two questions asked. Uh, yes, in terms of uh, the Pentagon and the State Department paying more attention to civil things, to energy, en energy assurance, uh, the, the Pentagon and the State Department represent U.S. interests, and U.S. interests are tied in with the global system, um, the global system of trade, energy. The U.S. has treaty and de facto allies, particularly in the Pacific Basin. Uh, all the way from Japan down to Vietnam. All of these countries are dependent in one measure or another for, to Middle East oil. They're the real countries that are dependent on Middle East energy more than the U.S. in a way. And they're all, for the most part, um, major U.S. allies. So the, U so the U.S. Navy particularly will be focused for years to come on protecting sea lines of communication across the Indian Ocean. Remember, the Indian Ocean is the world's energy interstate, uh, across which all the energy from the greater Middle East goes to much of the consumers in East Asia. And, uh, and the U.S. Navy sees its, uh, sees its prerogative as, as protecting that. And, there re real, a, a, and the U.S. State Department in that, in, that, in, in that regard knows that it's a matter of having you know, good diplomatic relations, not just with its allies, 
um, but particularly with, uh, uh, you know, with, with adversaries, and that, that's what gets me to the second part of your question on, uh, you know, on Middle East po political stability, where I think what's going on now between the U.S. and Iran is very, very important. The negotiations may not have succeeded in the first round, but they have not ended. And something clearly has changed between the U.S. and Iran. Both countries see it in their naked self-interest to, to have an understanding. It may not mean diplomatic relations. It may be formal, may be informal, but it's the kind of understanding that the U.S. had with China in 1972. Remember, the U.S. reached an understanding with China in 1972, but diplomatic relations with China were not established until 1979. So this is an ongoing process, and it's within a U.S.-Iranian rapprochement that I believe stability for the Middle East can be best improved. And that, that includes the Israeli-Palestinian issue. It means uh, the U.S. is not going to desert Saudi Arabia, not by any but, means. But what will happen if, for example, Saudi Arabia or the Gulf countries will, they, they are clearly a little bit critical towards these negotiations with the Iranians, and um, you spoke about trust and the question now maybe to Mehmet as well because you're working on that, how much trust from the Arab states is still left into the U.S.? Um, so we were the whole time talking about the perspective of the U.S., but um, how much trust does the region actually have in the U.S., actually also given that there are these negotiations going on with Iran? Yes, uh, I think there is an erosion of trust, definitely. If you judge from the statements coming from Riyadh, as well as from other Gulf nations, there is a feeling that without due consultation, U.S. has jumped and uh, de developing and improving, because you have to understand the mind frame in the Gulf region, where especially Saudi Arabia and other Gulf nations where there is a significant Shia minority as well, they feel threatened by the Shia arc in the region, led by Iran going all the way through Syria, Hezbollah, and now Iraq as well. So they were looking for the U.S. to assure them sort of a guarantee. And, but their regimes are also under threat right now after they have seen what happened in uh, Egypt uh, with the uh, Muslim Brotherhood and before that, Morsi, we discussed yesterday and the day before yesterday. So there is a crisis in the region of confidence. And Iran, therefore, is a very important um, milestone in seeing how it's going to develop. But clearly the U.S. wants to normalize relationship with Iran. This might be beneficial for the Gulf regions as well. If Iranian threat somehow uh, curtailed and constrained, this might be a welcome news. But there is a serious communications understanding crisis between the Gulf capitals and the U.S. definitely. I want to say a few words about China and the U.S. role there as well. Um, Yes, right now it's the United States ensuring security uh, of shipping lanes all around the world almost. But this is a very expensive undertaking. And as I said, some nations including China and India are the free riders and Japan as well. So this cannot go on like this because it's a very, very expensive. And the Chinese are seriously, Chinese generals from PLA are seriously concerned about possible disruptions of their shipments coming from Gulf and Africa. If there is a crisis between U.S. and uh, Beijing, let's say over Taiwan or South China Sea or other issues, they are concerned that this almost 85% of their supply coming from that region. The Seventh Fleet might disrupt them, at least theoretically. And as a result, Chinese are developing some alternative transportation lines. One of them is um, through, from China all the way through Central Asia and Iran to the Gulf which we thought this was a dream. You can't do it. I actually told this to CMPC executives in Beijing. I said, this is not commercially viable. And he laughed and responded by saying that, look, when we built the Great Wall of China, we didn't think whether it was commercially viable or not. This was essential for our national security. So they are building land-based pipelines. Also, they are also building uh, from the Indian Ocean, Myanmar, all the way to Yunnan province also from Pakistan, so they are trying to make sure that the energy supply will continue without disruption, and they are concerned about the U.S. impact, 
uh, in that regard. And we have uh, some more questions. I see uh, the gentle, oops, the gentleman there, yes, since you have the microphone, and then we come up in front. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Andreas Kremer, Ecologic Institute in Germany. When I look at the title of this panel, then it's quite clear that if all the oil, the gas, um, the fossil methane is extracted from the ground and is used, that we will have an enormous security challenge as a result of climate change, disrupting our food supply systems, uh, causing migration, co damaging all coastal infrastructure, um, transport, port facilities, all that. None of you guys have made the connection um, to the insecurity that can be caused by the use of those natural resources. And the same is true also for nuclear power. As we know, nuclear power leads to proliferation and leads to enormous risks. The cost of containing the nuclear program in Iran is enormous in diplomatic terms and trade terms. That also causes instability. Um, please address that. The second one is, Mr. Uguchi, I cannot let you get away with spreading false rumors about Germany. The German Energiewende is about phasing out nuclear first and foremost. Second, phasing out all fossil energies, going 100% renewable as fast as possible, within keeping that we want to phase out nuclear even more, and within keeping with our international obligations. The downward trend of emissions in Germany has been continuous since the 1990s. In the last two years, we had a slight increase again, and that has nothing to do with coal imports. It has more to do with the use of domestic coal as a consequence of coal being cheap, but more importantly, the EU, uh, EU emission trading system not working. It would not have happened if Putin had lowered gas prices. What you saw was a shift away from Russian gas into domestic lignite, in part in order to stabilize the French power grid, in part in order to export electricity to our um, other European partners. Why is it, Mr. Gutu, that the people who work in the fossil industry so blatantly ignore the facts about the energy vendor in Germany and spread myths about it? Thank you very much. Uh, one more question and then I'll take it back to the panel. Um, I see, maybe can we, can we go also from here, one question here and then I get in the second round to you in front. Maybe this gentleman first, please, if you don't. Thank you. Then I could. Uh, Jalan Ali from uh, Center of Development and Peace in Mediterranean, based in Belgium. Can you please speak into the microphone? A little bit higher, okay. Uh, Dr. Nali from the Center of Peace and, Mediter and uh, Development in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean, based in Belgium, Brussels. Uh, I would simply join one question, one, one, one uh, sentence you were talking about, is that uh, what the U.S. is doing exactly to keep positive influence in their old allies at the same time trying to share a little power and influence in some regions, as we are in North Africa. What about America's uh, plans on the region, like sharing uh, some influence and some power in the North African and Sub-Saharan and the Sahel region? Thank you. I'm not sure we understood your question, to be honest. If you, you were talking about, about the US should share influence yeah, in the region. Yeah, uh, everybody knows that uh, America is, uh, is having a lot of foreign policies, different foreign policies based on regions. And my question is specific to this region, as we know that there is a lot of resources and so. Uh, I, would, I would like to know what is the American policy for this region regarding sharing power and sharing some influence, it's more uh, geostrategic than uh, security. Thank you very much. Uh, Mehmet, maybe you want to um, first address what the gentleman asked from Germany about the Energiewende and that there is a misperception about what happened in Germany and the facts, please. Yes, I think um, one critical issue in Europe is that gas is becoming very expensive as you also mentioned. Gazprom is negotiating down to about 10%, which is nothing compared to the gas prices uh, in the world. And as a result, also the Germans made a political decision to phase out the nuclear power. And this is, of course, a decision. J Japanese also took a similar decision, and they reversed this decision as a result of the fact that uh, they couldn't replace 
natural gas uh, or other fossil fuels uh, by other means. And uh, so nuclear renaissance is still going on. It's not in the West, right or wrong, you, you can challenge, of course, uh, but the nuclear renaissance stopped mostly in the West, except in UK, perhaps. They just took a decision to renew it uh, with Chinese money and French technology. Uh, if you look at the number of nuclear power plants under construction in the world, most of them are in the East, in dynamic emerging economies. Even in United Arab Emirates, you have four nuclear reactors being built. Egypt would like to do the same thing, and Saudi Arabia as well, in order to reduce the share of oil in power consumption so that oil could be exported more and more. In Germany, I think there was a, uh, I wouldn't call mess perhaps like in the United States, but great difficulty in making the energy policy in line with the new realities. Because renewables, as I said, is not an easy uh, area. And uh, Germany is not known to be a very sunny nation for solar power, although the uh, per kilowatt hour cost of uh, solar power, photovoltaic, is coming down. And wind, of course, is a solution in certain places, but intermittency comes into picture again. So it's not, you don't have 24 hours. Therefore, you have to have backup power plants uh, fired by coal or gas or whatever you use for this reason. And none of the EU nations, including Germany, are on the way to achieve their targets, 20, 20, 20. I see that you are still saying that this is not correct, but of course you will have the floor I can to see respond. You two are going to have an interesting coffee break later, but yes. But overall, what I'm saying is that some nations, including Germany, had to re uh, revamp their energy policies to adapt to the new conditions. Some of them would like to give more share to, of course, renewables and cleaner energy. Some of them to nuclear. It's their choice. Also, one size doesn't fit all. So all nations will have different energy needs and mixture and geographical distribution of consumption and supply. And uh, so that's the one point that I wanted to make clearly. But nuclear, as I said, I'm not an advocate of nuclear. In my own country, there are now two nuclear powers being built and third is in the pipeline, but for emerging nations where the demand growth is so strong, where the supply is almost non-existent, Turkey is importing 98% of its natural gas and 92% of oil, nuclear is one of the key solutions. Okay, thanks very much, Mehmet. Uh, Robbie, maybe you would, uh, would you like to address the question, basically, what are the strategies for the region? Right. Would so you like to share the power with the region? Right, so let me, uh, let me quickly go back to, not the German, qu the question about climate change. And then I can say something about the region, but I, I can't really speak to some of the broader questions of the region. But on climate change, you know, that's not what we do, but let me just say this, that um, uh, Greenpeace put out a study and showed that um, if you looked at the carbon that's still in the ground, that the four out of the 14 largest future emitting projects, eight of them are actually oil. They're not coal and they're not natural gas. So, um, so many people in the United States are focused on, and, and in Europe actually, are focused on tar sands, what they call, or oil sands from Canada and how the, building this pipeline from Canada down to the United States will you know, break the bank, as they say, on climate. The truth is, is that if we continue to burn the amount of oil, even conventional oil, uh, forget unconventional oil, it breaks the bank on climate. It causes, uh, it, it goes over the international, what they believe is the two, de two degree amount. So you really, as I said before, in order to solve your oil dependence problem, and in order to solve the climate problem, you need the same solution, which is you can't have oil as your only fuel in the transportation sector. And so if you have electric vehicles, let me use that as an example, you are now plugging your vehicles into the grid. Um, and then one can improve their grid using renewables. And as you do that, not only um, are you changing how you're producing electricity for your in industrial and your residential sectors, but now you're actually impacting your transportation sector as well. So the only way to deal with the threefold problem of economic risk, national security risk, or geopolitical risk, and climate risk would be to find another fuel for the transportation sector, uh, electricity being one and natural gas vehicles being the other. As for this region, I would just say this, that the short-term supply of, natural of oil and natural gas in the United States and the increase has had some impact um, in countries like Algeria, um, Angola, and others, because what we've seen is that the United States needs less of their oil. 
And by needing less of their oil, um, they've had to find other markets. And to find those other markets, uh, they've had to give a lot of discount in the price of crude. One is because transportation costs to get them to Asia is so much more than getting it to the United States. And secondly, the refineries in Asia are less equipped to take that type of oil versus the uh, oil coming out of Saudi Arabia, um, so the light, sweet crude versus the heavy. So, the um, so you've seen some of these. You've yeah. seen some of these countries in this short-term crisis, whereas they've expected more money than they've than they've actually gotten because they are not selling to where their former uh, supply. Uh, so, so his question was also about the, the po sharing the power uh, with with the region. Maybe quickly one right, sentence. Right, right. Uh, ju just two uh, a sentence on nuclear power. A sentence on sharing power. During the Cold War, nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons were in the control of two very conservative, stodgy bureaucracies, the United <laughs> States and the Soviet Union. Uh, so even though we were faced with nuclear Armageddon, nothing happened during the 45 years in terms of a nuclear war. I think the danger is greater now, actually, because you have nuclear weapons in the hands of countries with weaker command and control systems, uh, uh, driven more by ethnic and other kinds of animosities, uh, where, where the politics is hotter rather than the cool politics of Washington and Moscow by comparison. And of course, why would North Korea give up its nuclear program after Gaddafi gave up his nuclear program and the United States helped topple him? Um, in terms of uh, the Middle East sharing power, the, the American power can do a lot of things. But one thing it cannot do is set, um, is set complex Islamic societies on the ground to rights as we found out in the last decade in Afghanistan and particularly in Iraq, and which is why it wasn't even tried in Syria. So I think what you're going to see is a two-pronged approach. The United States is going to try to have a, a, an understanding with Iran in order to put its house in order in the region, but it's going to get less, less and less involved in the internal politics of individual countries. Thanks very much. I hope this was uh, answering your question. Otherwise, feel free to chase them later. Uh, I see two more questions here, and I see you have already the microphones, please. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Khalid Benamou. I'm uh, the managing director of the Sahara Wind Project, uh, taking advantage of the trade winds to, to power North African load centers and probably also connecting it to Europe. My question is, uh, you know, on the role of the United States, its military, and uh, what appears to be an energy transition, like it or not. We've seen how China is addressing renewable energies very aggressively. We've seen the political uh, uh, dimension of Germany, which has transformed actually European policy in terms of introduction of renewable energies. And looking at Europe, you can't help through that military relationship with the United States to look at NATO and the positioning of its uh, alliance. We're actually implementing uh, North Africa's first wind hydrogen systems in, in, in uh, colleges in Morocco and Mauritania, uh, green campuses, to harness uh, uh, wind energy into hydrogen, which can then address the fundamental question of transportation and uh, its over-reliance on oil. Knowing that also the military uh, is engaged, as we speak, the U.S. military is engaged in uh, dealing with the consequences of the hurricane in the Philippines, uh, we know that climate change will also uh, have a dimension in, in, in the global e energy issue. Now, my question is, the United States is also known for its technological capacity to transform, uh, you know, major uh, transportation, the automobile, uh, etc. How do you think, you mentioned 2020 for the shale gas uh, peak of uh, oil and ga gas production in the U.S. How do you think this window of time can be used to transform the U.S. Uh, transportation sector, and you think that the U.S. gas, shale gas, will be burned in gas in U.S. transportation fleets, or perhaps also in uh, fuel cells, and then driving a whole technological revolution. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much for your question, and the gentleman sitting next to you, please. I'm Zach Pesh, Moroccan student in the National School of trade and management instead. You essentially know that Morocco has a very important role to play in the North uh, Africa. Our country is engaged right now in a North prospection, a very large drilling in South region, in Sahara. 
the security question is supposed to be a real challenge for Morocco and uh, all his world partners. How are you seeing Morocco and the North Africa region if Morocco become a new producer and exporter? How should we deal with security uh, challenges? Thank you very much. Excuse me. It's very much. Uh, sorry, I have just, to get back. Just the third question. It's going to be exciting if you allow me. So to Excuse Mr. me. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, but you had two questions, and uh, I want. No, Ten I'm seconds. sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe later, but let's give others Thanks. who had no chance. Please, you can maybe ask later the question. Back to the panel. Um, who would like for so, Robbie? Uh, yeah, I, look, I'm really hopeful about the future. I you know the projections from the government agencies are low, but I wouldn't be doing my business if I, I didn't think we had uh, hope. I'm a big, uh, I believe that technology can help us if we do the right things. Um, look, one of the biggest problems in oil is that there's not a free market. I mean, that's the biggest problem. I mean, you have OPEC on one side that's managing the market is one issue, and keeping the prices, you know, the the uh, head of uh, OPEC said the other day, or maybe last month, he said, I think the prices are just excellent. Um, you know, and, and you can only say the prices are excellent if you have some control over the supply you put on the market and not. The other problem is you have national oil companies. And they are underinvesting. So whereas uh, international oil companies invest most of their profits back into finding more oil and producing it, national oil companies, of course, give it back to their government, who then use it for social and government budgets. And so I think that due to the unfree nature of the market, you need policies in countries that are big consumers of oil to solve the problem and get new t cars on the road. And the best way to do that is electric vehicles, I believe, for the light duty sector. Um, that's our passenger vehicles. And there's a lot of hope. You know, in the United States, we just passed our 150,000 150, electric vehicles. And so, um, yes, there's 250 million other vehicles. But when you look at electric vehicles in the United States, there's actually 14 models now. And at this time in the history of hybrids, if you know of hybrid vehicles, um, there are only three models. There's actually three times more uh, high, uh, electric vehicles on the roads three years in than there were uh, of hybrids. So I think it's a slow process. And I think it can be expedited by focusing on certain communities and getting it right proving the nature and the fundamental nature of how the electric car interacts with the grid. And if we can show how these two things work together, everyone will understand why it's cheaper to own the car over time, why it adds to your resiliency of your grid because you can use the electricity in your batteries of your car to power your house, certainly uh, during blackouts. So that's number one. Number two is I think natural gas's role in transportation in, in America will mostly be in the heavy duty truck sector. And so that's using for 18 wheelers, et cetera. And I think if you, and then you have biofuels to be used for airplanes. So you take those three things, electric in the light duty sector, heavy duty trucks using natural gas, both liquid and compressed natural gas, and then uh, biofuels for air travel. That's how you ultimately solve the problem. Now other countries have done other things. There's a lot of natural gas in Italy in their vehicles and in Pakistan and other places, but I, they, they just don't seem to have the infrastructure in the United States to, uh, to do those things. So hydrogen, look, electric vehicles, I believe, are step one to hydrogen. So remember, hydrogen cars are electric vehicles, but have the fuel source, hydrogen, on board, where electric vehicles that we have today are plugged into the grid. And so my belief is you get enough electric vehicular transportation on the road, and whether we plug it into the wall now or we then transfer it to have uh, hydrogen on board in the next 10, 15 years, we've solved our problem. So I don't see these two things as competing. I see them as part of the same process away from oil to other types of fuel sources. Thanks very much. Uh, you wanted to add one or two sentences before we get to the role of Morocco? Uh, yeah, I'd like to also answer on the Moroccan issue. The Moroccan issue, then uh, please, Mehmet, if you want to answer that. Uh, Yes, I think on the renewables, the only thing I say is that the pricing, unfortunately, will determine which kind of fuel that nations will choose. And uh, if the shale gas and other unconventionals, abundance of other supplies, will dominate the market, the nations, uh, governments have not much choice. Of course, we all have the desire and want to, of course, deal with the climate change. By the way, U.S. is dealing with it with very well as a result of the new productions coming online. And now U.S. levels are at the 1994 level, even without signing up the Kyoto and approving it. U.S. is complying with the climate change uh, obligations somehow, while the European share is increasing. 
And uh, so I think my word on the renewables is that the pricing will determine which kind of fuels uh, that we will be choosing. With regard to Morocco, I wouldn't claim to be an expert on Moroccan energy, but my interest in Morocco is that one of the companies where I sit on the board, Genel Energy, we just started exploring here in Morocco a couple of new acreages because we believe that there is a potential here. The biggest problem, energy security problem Morocco has is that uh, the insufficiency of domestic resources in oil and gas. Also, renewables is a very small in power generation. I think it's around 10%. So there is a huge potential here in this country for solar and wind. As I said, one size doesn't fit all. Countries like Morocco, there is a great potential in terms of wind and uh, solar to be tapped. Uh, but energy is becoming a large economic problem as well here because the import, energy import bill is so huge in the overall budget context. Therefore, I think there is a need here also to understand uh, the share, the, the, uh, the comparative uh, share in the energy mix of different fuels, not only oil and gas, renewables, and also increase the domestic uh, production of oil and gas. And there is a very attractive uh, hydrocarbon law now in place. And also we are quite happy about the energy governance in Morocco, promoting greater investment. And uh, there is a need also to increase the share of renewables significantly then where it is today. Thanks very much, Robert. On Morocco? Uh, yes, very quickly on Morocco. I think Morocco and Oman have come out of the Arab Spring the strongest. Um, in terms of, um, of, of having uh, lib uh, liberal, semi-autocratic leaders who've made reforms, uh, Morocco's dynasty is older than the United States of America. It's a real country. It's, it's not artificial. It wasn't colonized by the Turks. It, you know, it has a high Berber uh, representation, all of which gives it an identity, a very unique individual cultural identity. It's framed by the Atlas Mountains and the Atlantic Ocean and a bit of the Mediterranean. So there's nothing artificial about Morocco. That combined with, as I said, the way it's reacted to the Arab Spring, I think uh, Morocco at one end of the Arab world and Oman at the other end are the real stars of the last few years. Which I'm sure is going to make a lot of people happy here. Um, are there any other questions? So then I would like to give you the chance to ask your third exciting question since we have a couple of minutes left, please. The gentleman in the, in the beige suit. Was there another question? I'm sorry, I didn't see you, please. I introduce yourself and th the question. Shawat uh, Kardoudi, I am uh, the president of uh, the Moroccan Institute of International Relations. And as you know, and you have already said, Morocco imports a lot of oil, which is very, uh, very heavy on our uh, budget. Uh, my question to you, our experts, what do you think about the price of oil in the next months or the next years, because we are, of course, very interested about that. Thank you. Thanks very much. And then please, your, your question, and then we'll take it back to the panel. I don't see any other. Microphone, please, not working. I'll give you mine. Okay, the question is shared between my friend Diamond and Mr. Kaplan. So, for the policemen of the world, NATO, would they have been not attack Libya if they, if they didn't give their uh, program of uh, weapon of mass destruction? The same thing wouldn't have been, ha is not, we can see it in Syria, like the NATO and the, the European Council uh, and the, the Security Council is is, is taken apart from intervening in, in, in Syria because of the, could, could we say because of the mass destruction? And for my friend from Turkey, lately we have seen the, the Turkish government like taking 
little by little his distance from the crisis from Syria. Is the pipeline, the, the Qatari pipelines that were supposed to go through there have been shifted to another investment or another strategy? And thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, the question to the panel, the price of oil. Maybe each of you quickly and then we'll take the... Uh, yes. Um, well, we are expecting some new supply to come to the market, especially from Iraq. There will be increased uh, production for export. Also in the KRG part, Kurdish regional government part of Iraq, currently they are producing about 200,000 barrels. But if the pipeline through Turkey could be open, it could go up to 1 million. And then Iran, of course, will be increasing its export as a result of normalization if this happens. And if this happens, of course, there will be more supply in the market. The logical uh, market uh, calculations says that if there is more supply than demand, the price might co come down. And I, I don't put so much hope on the tight oil, shale oil, and uh, sand oil, because these are very expensive oil to produce. In Iraq, we produce oil 2.5 barrels, uh, $2 uh, per barrel. So this is very inexpensive. Uh, offshore, as well as the uh, unconventional oil, also very expensive to extract. So our calculations in the companies where we work is on the base of uh, the band, $80, $100. If it goes down $80, it will not be economic for increasing our investment. So $80 is the threshold. But we saw in the past, 2008, you remember, in July it came up to $148, then by December it came down to $30. This is not realistic either. The, the fundamentals, oil price fundamentals, show us that $80, $100 is the right price. If above the ground factors, geopolitical flash, flash points, clashes, tensions, what you have, this might, of course, temporarily put the prices up, but we expect it to stabilize. And for Morocco, the other point I want to make is that you are surrounded by hydrocarbon-rich neighbors. And unfortunately, Morocco, if I'm not wrong, is importing from faraway countries. So there is a need for developing this regional integration and so that you can have favorable pricing with your neighbors, security of supply, uh, as well as providing infrastructure for them to sell to other markets via Morocco. So there is lots to be done between Morocco and its neighbors, Libya, Algeria, and Tunisia, where there are rich hydrocarbon reserves. Thank you. Quickly, Robbie and Robert on the price, and then we'll get to the last question. Yeah, so uh, on the price, first of all, if I knew the price of oil, I'd be a much richer man, and I probably wouldn't be sitting on this stage. So um, That's too bad, actually. I thought yes, you'd like us. Yes, you know. Um, I would have brought in my yacht uh, before. Uh, anyways, uh, I would say that uh, there are a few things. I, I don't disagree with those things, but I think one has to keep in mind the government budgets of the OPEC members. So yes, it only takes them $2 to produce the oil, but if one looks at how much money is required by these governments uh, to fund their budgets, uh, they require between $100, $95 to $130 for between Saudi Arabia, Russia, uh, Iran. And so the price is going to be determined in some ways as much as they're able to. So the question is, is if more oil floods into OPEC, what do they end up doing? But they're gonna wanna keep the price between as I say, 95 and $120, because they need to fund their government budgets. And so one has to look at that side of the, uh, of the, of the question on the price of oil, because in the end of the day, as I said, they're sort of deciding how much oil to put on the market in order to manage that market. Remember, uh, OPEC is sitting on 80% of reserves, 80% of reserves, but they have only produced, you said a third, um, I think it's, uh, it's around 40%. Um, and, and it's supposed to go up to about 46%, and this has been over the last 40 years. So it's a, clear, it's a clear game that goes on about how much in order to keep the price within a certain level. Now, of course, there's high points because of global instability, hurricanes, other things we can't predict today. And then there are low points because as you hit the high point, you drive the global economy, including Morocco, into recession because they have to be able to pay for this. And that's what drives you down then maybe 30 is too low but drives you into the $60. And so I think that's really what troubles us um, in our organization, which is this uh, monopoly in the transportation sector and the complete lack of any ability to predict 
um, unlike many commodities. The, and that is my last point, and then I'll stop. The CEO of United Airlines, everyone knows United Airlines, um, said it best, I thought. He said, I can run a profitable airline at $150 oil, and I can run a profitable airline at $60 oil, but they're two totally different looking airlines. So we can't just focus on price as a problem. One needs to focus on volatility and the price that goes really low to really high to really low and to really high. And these are the two problems that I think if we had a transportation sector that was not 100% dependent on oil, uh, one could then uh, not be so, uh, so uh, whipsawed back and forth based on the, these uh, events and, and uh, decisions in the oil market. Thank you. Thanks very much, Robbie. Robert, uh, briefly uh, on yeah, the price. Uh, They've, they've said it all. Let me just add in terms of the price of oil. I can't predict it, but in t in despite everything you've been reading in the media about how the world population is graying and aging and the growth, population growth is slowing down because the absolute numbers on the earth are larger than they've ever been in terms of absolute growth. We're growing in many places faster than ever before and, middle, and the w global middle class is going to continue to expand at a great pace, which means we're going to have more and more consumers and more and more demand for energy, which will affect the price. Do you want me to answer yes, this, Yes, I gentlemen? was about to say, let's stay here. Yeah. You uh, let me it. just, a sentence or two of clarification on WMD in Libya and Syria and why the U.S. intervened and didn't intervene. Um, the U.S. intervention in Syria was against a leader who had voluntarily given up his whole nuclear and WMD program some years before. And this, you know, and this is, not, the, the intervention in Libya we can de debate off stage, but in terms of like, uh, in, in terms of being problematic for future proliferation, uh, what the lesson of Libya was, if you've got nukes, don't give them up. Um, you know, uh, Iran is a separate case because it's a great empire, it's got a, a multiple levers of power, it's, uh, um, you know, Iran can trade away elements of its nuclear program, whereas small, weaker countries like Libya and North Korea cannot. On Syria, um, the, the, the reason why the United States did not intervene militarily in a, in a demonstrable fashion in Syria was ultimately because there was no American public support for it. Um, that's why President Obama pulled back. And the public was not misinformed. The public knew that they had, w, that they had chemical weapons. The public even showed through opinion polls that they, that they admitted that the Syrian government had used the chemical weapons. But there was still no public support for an intervention, and the only reason there may be a build down in the chemical weapons facilities is because of a diplomatic deal between the United States and Russia. So you don't think it's related to the energy question, because that is... No, what no, I don't. don't. I don't. No, but let me ask, and this is our last round, but when we listen to what uh, Robert said, and what we all debated here, it sounds like for the United States, Iran and Iraq are going to be the next new big partners when it comes to the production of oil or to the energy sufficiency. So, Robbie, maybe because we, I see that the organizer is already saying we have to stop, but if you could um, say two sentences to that and then Mehmet, please. Yeah, we're doing an analysis that we're going to be putting out in January that looks at the geopolitics uh, based on energy. And what we have is a section called wild cards. Things that you, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, but if they do happen, they're going to have a dramatic impact. And in those wild cards, we have uh, three or four things. You know, one thing is Iran, what happens, um, we actually have four things. Iran, what happens with that? Iraq, if there's stability and they grow from 2.53 million barrels to six, as uh, IEA predicts, or 9.6, like, Iraq wants, who lets, what does OPEC end up doing to allow them in? Uh, third is the stability of Saudi Arabia. Of course, if anything happens there, it's a pretty much game over in the uh, oil sector. And then fourth, on the demand side, what does China end up doing? Because if China gets a handle on its demand, and that means, yes, its transportation fleet's going to grow, it's actually larger than the United States per sales per year, and it's supposed to pass the United States in the fleet of cars by 2020. Um, just as one statistic, 
There are 38 cars per thousand people in China. There are 800 cars per thousand people in the United States. So China has a lot of room to grow. But if they grow using natural gas vehicles, or they grow using electric vehicles, or they grow using more efficient vehicles like their uh, current laws state, that could have a game-changing impact on demand in the world. So I think those are the four things I'd call wildcard scenarios that can really change the nature of the oil market and the future of the energy world. I just quickly have to ask you, you went, because you mentioned Saudi Arabia and the destabilization, what exactly are you talking about so that uh, it's clear uh, no, I'm just No, I'm just saying it's, uh, it's a very unstable region. You have Shia Sunni uh, issues uh, there. You've got a monarchy with uh, old, uh, you know, the, this generation of uh, kings. Um, you know, it's going to have to pass on to the next generation. Who's going to take over? What's that going to mean? I'm, I'm not saying anything that it's an unstable. I'm just saying that there's lots of questions that will be out there for the next 5, 10, 15 years, and that will have a dramatic impact. Now, hopefully, everything stays as it is, and it uh, continues to be a very stable uh, country, and, that is, uh, and uh, they continue to, as I say, manage those final barrels of oil off the market. But, you know, I'm just saying that's, a wild, that's why it's called a wild card. You don't really know, but one can't uh, predict, and you have to be aware. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mehmet? Uh, first, a couple of words about Syria and Turkey here. Sorry, I, I couldn't answer this before. Uh, Syria, of course, is becoming a huge headache for Turkey. And initially, uh, there was a euphoria in Turkey that what happened in Libya and the rest of the uh, Arab Spring countries will repeat in uh, Syria as well. In a couple of months, Assad will go you know, at the head of the minority Shia uh, Alevite population, and then a majority Sunni government will come to power. And, but it has proven to be a wrong assessment because behind Assad also Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah of Lebanon stood very firmly. And it has become a global issue rather than a regional issue. And as a result, Turkey suffered a great deal. Uh, most, almost 800,000 uh, refugees now, not in the camps, but within the Turkish cities. And also Al-Qaeda uh, on the borders. And the Kurdish issue is becoming a serious matter for Turkey. So it has backfired Turkey's assertive and active policy in Syria. I think it has learned its lessons. Now Turkey is scaling back its uh, heavy engagement in Syria because its initial uh, objectives in terms of having another uh, peaceful, stable neighbor next to it, uh, where the democracy, human rights, and political freedoms could be prevailing, didn't work as it planned. And on the uh, final word about the region is that I think the Gulf and MENA over the next 10 years will be a quite different land than today in many ways, in terms of political successions, the crisis, and how Iran, Iraq will be accommodated, the relations uh, vis-a-vis uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, where there is sizable uh, Shia minorities. The role of China in the region will also evolve. Today, it's a quite benign power, just interested in uh, supplies of oil and gas, uh, cross investments, uh, trades. But the Chinese influence will grow stronger. It's not going to remain only in, as a soft power, economically speaking. So 10 years from now, it's going to be different. Unfortunately, I want to I mean, uh, finish with a positive note. But when you talk about energy, oil, gas, uh, pricing, and geopolitics prevail, and uh, rather than collaboration, uh, signs of confrontation we see will be growing further. So the region has to be ready for that. Robert, last word? Uh, yes. Uh, yes, just finally. Uh, we've seen massive upheavals across the Middle East since two, the early 2011. Uh, instability, chaos in quite a few places, yet the, the stock market has not been affected very much. It may have priced it in a bit, but it's essentially not been bothered by chaos in Libya, chaos in Yemen, chaos in Syria. Um, even all that much by chaos in Iraq. Um, but if Saudi Arabia were to unde undergo instability, uh, then you would see global stock markets, I think, uh, tre tremendously affected. Saudi Arabia has a diminishing underground water table. 
It has, uh, you know, extreme levels of unemployment among male youth. It has a royal family that is passing from an inner core to a much vaster array of grandchildren, uh, which means the succession crisis may become acute in future years and decades. Um, so Saudi Arabia will, uh, uh, will be harder and harder to govern is the way I would put it. Uh, rather than predict upheaval, I would just say it would be harder and harder to govern. And then just one final sentence. If you're looking at geopolitics from the one-dimensional view of merely energy, uh, the United States will be in a, continue, a continued strong position because it will require less and less energy from outside. It will have more flexibility inside, whereas India and China um, you know, will, will still be dependent on the greater Middle East, and Russia's, uh, R Russia's dominance of energy markets will also somewhat diminish. Thanks very much. Please join me to thank the three panelists here. Um, and I think the next panel is going to be up soon. Thank you very much. Thanks.